Hello everyone, I'm Gustav and I'm here to talk about our motion model Moglo, which is joint work with the other first author, Simon Alexanderson and Jonas Beskov. Um, so in a nutshell, we present a statistical model for motion that's based on normalizing flows. And there are no task specific assumptions in here. So the method is completely general and can be applied to any type of motion. It's easy to train and it's easy to use. Because it's probabilistic, it describes a range of different motions, which we shall see are, are also plausible motions. And it is controllable in a way that is suitable both for interactive applications and offline scenarios. And we demonstrate that we get state-of-the-art results in a range of different applications. In this presentation, we look at locomotion generation in particular. So this talk will be a technical presentation. If what you want to do is hear a high level overview and see lots of video of what the output from the method looks like, then please see uh, the YouTube video accessible through our project webpage here before going through the talk. And after listening to the presentation, if you want more details, you can read the paper or uh, see uh, look at our code to see how we did things. So in the rest of this talk, I will talk about why we want probabilistic models of motion, what normalizing flows are and how they can be applied to model motion, um, some experiments to verify that the method works well, and some concluding words. So why do we want our motion models to be probabilistic? Uh, well, there is more than one way to perform any given motion. And if you ask a human to repeat a motion, it's never going to come out exactly the same way twice. So a good motion model should capture that diversity. Um, and philosophically, if what the real world does is a distribution of things, there's no way a point mass, a, deter a deterministic model can be made to look like that. So we can always tell a, a fake model and the real world apart. Mm. For some deterministic models, we can say more. If we minimize the mean square error, the uh, true minimizer of that is the conditional mean. So a well-trained such model would generate the average motion under all possibilities. And this is called, for called mean collapse because that motion isn't very good. So here's an intuition for that. In high dimensions, motion data lies on some low dimensional manifold like this. And this is all the motion that's possible. And then given some control information or context information that might narrow down to a range of motion that's compatible with this particular uh, scenario or context. And then the average is just the center of gravity of um, uh, the, all this motion, which is like this. But if the control input is not as decisive and leaves ambiguity, there might be a wider range of motion that's compatible with this. And then the average is more obviously unnatural and lies off of the manifold. Mm. So here we see what this can look like with um, a well-trained minimum mean square error model on the left, which just generates the average pose floating around the circle, and our method on the right, which generates natural looking walking samples every time. Now let's talk about probabilistic models using normalizing flows. There are three things we want when we model probability distributions. We want to be able to compute probabilities easily so we can train using maximum likelihood. It needs to be fast to use the methods and generate output by sampling. And the, the model family has to be sufficiently flexible to represent the real world distributions we're interested in. Um, so here's a table of how uh, classical and more recent approaches fare in that respect. Um, a um, classic approach like mean square error will predict the mean and maybe add some Gaussian noise on top. This is easy to, to train and sample from, but it's not sufficiently flexible to describe motion because motion is not Gaussian. Variational autoencoders can in principle describe uh, strongly non-Gaussian distributions, but in practice, it's been shown uh, theoretically and empirically that this promise is not realized and they behave mostly like a Gaussian distribution anyways. Now, generative adversarial networks, they are different. They have been shown to generate very high quality output in, for instance, image generation and other applications. But this comes at the cost of not being able to train them in any reasonable way. Um, and the cool thing about normalizing flows is they use the same basic structure for generating output, but the generator neural network is replaced by an invertible neural network. And that allows training based on maximum likelihood. Because if x is an invertible function f of z, then we can use the change of variables formula to compute the log likelihood here as shown. And even if f is not a very strongly nonlinear transformation, we can chain many of these together to uh, achieve a much more flexible transformation overall. 
just like um, each layer in a neural network is quite weakly nonlinear, but taken together, neural nets are very uh, powerful function approximators. So here's um, an example where we try to generate the two moons data set on the left uh, from a Gaussian distributed point cloud on the right by transforming the point cloud with four steps of flow. So let's animate what that looks like. So we see that they're sort of stretching and compressing in different areas that's different depending on, on the value. And this way we can achieve a lot of flexibility in our transformation. So here's a particular invertible neural network architecture that we're using, that's called GLOW. And it has three steps. There's an affine transformation that replaces batch norm. There's a linear transformation that basically rotates, permutes, and mixes the different elements in the vector. And that's important because the secret source layer, the nonlinear coupling layer, it transforms parts of the variables with respect to the other part. So here's how that looks in more detail. So if the input is B, it's split into two parts. One of them is not changed, but it's used to compute offsets and scaling factors used to transform the other half of the variables, uh, like so. And to, it's very easy to see that this can be inverted because if we have Z, we actually also have the B values we need to compute S and, and T and undo the transformation. So how do we turn normalizing flows into a motion model? Uh, we'll let motion be a sequence of poses, which are represented by vectors. And we're going to use a normalizing flow to generate uh, poses sequentially from a latent uh, random variable like this. Now, poses are not independent. So in order for the next pose to be consistent with the previous ones, we use autoregression and condition the next step distribution on the previous poses like this. Um, how do we make the flow conditional on this information? Well, we take the conditioning information here, here labeled C and feed it into the affine coupling layer, specifically into the network A in that layer. And this way, if we have C, we can turn X into Z or vice versa. Um, and then to generate a sequence of, of, of poses, we just generate a uh, pose once, one at a time and slide it along using a new random latent variable for each step. Now to make the motion depend on uh, values further back uh, in the sequence uh, and add long memory, we can use a hit, uh, an LSTM uh, inside the network A. And this also seemed to stabilize training in our scenario. Uh, but this is so far just an unconditional model of motion. We want to make it conditional on some per frame control signal. And to do that, uh, we take the control signal and also feed it into the flow. And by making it conditional only on the current value and the previous value of the control signal, uh, this can be controlled interactively because we're not using future control that's not available yet in, in an online scenario. And what we do is we just take the two types of conditioning information and concatenate them together when feeding into the flow. Now, this has an issue in that the autoregressive information is much more informative about the next pose than is the control input. So it's easy to learn a model that only listens to the autoregression, but doesn't generate outputs that's consistent with the control. And to overcome that, we add a per post dropout, data dropout, that basically drops out the poses from the autoregression with a certain uh, probability. This sort of rebalances the informational value in the autoregression versus the control inputs. And here's uh, the effect of that. So on the left, without dropout, we see that the mo motion is internally consistent, but does not respect the control signal. And on the right, we get motion that's both smooth and consistent with the control. OK, but does it work? Here are some experiments we performed to test that. So we looked at uh, path-based control of locomotion, which is when the input is a path uh, on the floor that the root node has to follow, and the motion has to animate a sequence of poses along that path that uh, creates consistent uh, and convincing motion. And we looked at this at locomotion specifically and not say uh, gesture generation because locomotion makes it very easy to spot artifacts like salient artifacts such as foot sliding are easy to see and can even be quantified objectively. So um, to demonstrate the generality of the method, we looked at generating motion for two very different morphologies, humans and dogs. And uh, when we performed these experiments, no method had been demonstrated to work well for both of these tasks. Uh, for more details on the data and data processing, please see our paper. Here's a table from the paper of the systems that we considered. There are two task agnostic baselines that work for any type of motion and two baselines that represent the task specific state of the art. 
Quaternet is the state of the art in bipedal locomotion generation, and mode adaptive neural networks are the state of the art in uh, quadrupedal locomotion generation. This should be compared against Moglo, which is coded MG. Note that Moglo has no algorithmic latency, whereas most of the other systems have at least one second of latency. Also, we considered some ablations to study the effects of important design choices in Moglo. Um, we evaluated uh, the output of Moglo both uh, objectively and subjectively. Objectively, we performed a footstep analysis that's reported in the paper. Subjectively, we performed two crowdsourced user studies, one for the human, one for the dog, um, on the figure eight platform, where users rated the naturalness of different animation clips for both held out and synthetic control input with synthetic control input representing something that you might use when generating animations or moving a character in a video game. And the stimuli that we rated are available in a supplementary material. Note that uh, neither the stimuli nor the vid videos in this presentation applied any types of foot stabilization or other post-processing to the raw model output. Um, here is a bar chart of the ratings for the human data. We note that Moglo performs well on both held out control and synthetic control, comparable to the natural motion on the far left. And here is a summary of all the ratings uh, from the paper, both for the human and quadrupedal study and for both held out and synthetic control. This row shows the average ratings of Moglo in each scenario. We notice that these are always better than the task agnostic baselines reported here, and often by a statistically significant margin. On the other hand, Moglo is not statistically significantly worse than either of the two, two task specific baselines, even though these systems actually have access to future control input and can use that to maybe generate more consistent motion, whereas Moglo has no algorithmic latency. And finally, compared to natural motion, Moglo is, is rated close to this and is only significantly different in the case of the dog data. Uh, as for the ablations, we learn, for instance, that data dropout has a significantly positive effect on uh, the model behavior. So, so far, we've confirmed that the output has high quality, but is it also probabilistic in a meaningful way? If we feed uh, the model uh, the exact same control input, is it going to give us a qualitatively different output? So we looked at this by training models on motion capture data for video games. Um, and specifically, we trained it also on more and more diverse subsets of this data, and we wanted to see if we can get diverse um, motion out, uh, out as well. So here's an example of meaningfully different output for the same control input. When sometimes we see that the model can walk forward normally, sometimes it might uh, aim like with a gun, and sometimes we get wacky locomotion like hopping, all for the same control input and model. And with even more diverse input, the model can learn behaviors such as a stumbling motion. So let's sum up. We've achieved a new state of the art in probabilistic motion generation in a manner that's completely task agnostic, doesn't make any assumptions about the nature of the motion. And we're able to generate a whole range of meaningfully different behavior from the probabilistic model. And we achieve control over the output in a way that does not incur any algorithmic latency and therefore also can be used in interactive scenarios. Among other findings, we find that normalizing flows deliver on their promise outlined earlier in the presentation. We find that data dropout is a simple and effective way to make models listen to the control. Um, in some GANs and VAEs and other model, generative models, um, it's common to change the trained model to re reduce the amount of randomness at generation time. But these kinds of, sort of tricks of reducing the temperature was not needed here. And we got the best results with, with just reusing the trained model. The model is sufficiently strong for that. We saw that to generate unusual behaviors such as sidestepping or walking backwards, data augmentation helped. And finally, for both the dog uh, data and the human data, the stimulus where the model was asked to stand uh, completely still was the one that was rated the lowest in the subjective studies. Um, you might ask, does this generalize beyond locomotion? And the answer to that is yes. After the experiments described in this presentation, we've also applied uh, this uh, method to speech and gesture generation and face and head motion synthesis, getting good results in both cases. And with this celebration dance generated by our method, I want to thank you for listening and sticking with us all the way to the end.